We all understand the importance of research and innovation in our day-to-day -day lives and the ways in which they are transforming the world. Equally important is our collaboration in this great effort and deployment of research outputs and innovations on a scale that will reach the target audience. And this is not just another scientific task. It is where all researchers and student researchers come together in partnership. I believe that by participating in this webinar, we are in the right place and the right time. Together, let us accelerate the exchange of ideas and scaling up of good practices in research. I am confident that you will find new ideas from the experts who are present here tonight in this webinar. I am Dr. J, Research Director of Academia de San Lorenzo and Research Lecturer at Valenzuela City Polytechnic College and the Senior High School Principal of St. Joseph School of Lawang Bato, Valenzuela City. Serving as your event chairman and moderator of this webinar. My dear colleagues and fellow researchers, let us ask the guidance of our Almighty Father through a prayer this is to be followed by the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. Our ever-loving Father, the core of every reason, the source of truth, you who made the earth and the heavens are the ultimate goal of every knowledge seekers, the infinite wisdom, the cause of all that is good. We are truly grateful for this opportunity to gather together as a community despite the challenges we face each day. Yet you remained and gave us strength to carry on the responsibilities of bearing intelligence and using them for better purposes. We now humbly ask you to join us in our endeavor to explore the wonders of life in the world for knowledge's sake, that in whatever we learn today, we become more grounded to you, who is truth, who is love. We pray that you bless our speakers the fount of your infinite knowledge, that they can share something worthwhile despite the limited time we have. They can channel all they know and share to us the beauty and truth of living as your child. We pray that you guide our participants, the seekers of your boundless knowledge, that they may continue to persevere in the search and be deemed worthy to share what they learn from today's session. Sanctify us, O Lord, not because we are worthy of it, but because we believe in your love and mercy, that at the end of the day, we can take home something that's amazing and meaningful. This we ask and pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas.
This event is an initiative of the EPCOR Educational Research Center to equip its research consultants with the necessary knowledge and skills in the conduct of research, as well as to enable them to become better research consultants. This series for EPCOR's research consultants are also open to the public, especially students and educators who wish to improve themselves in the field of research writing. At this point, I would like to recognize the presence of the following very important persons at EPCOR. Starting off with Dr. Richard D. Sanchez, the head research consultant. Dr. Ace C. Lagman, the national consultant for research publications and trainings. Dr. Ian I. Llanares, the National Deputy Consultant for Research Publications and Trainings. Also, I would like to recognize EPCOR's national consultants, regional coordinators, provincial division city coordinators, and all EPCOR research consultants who are present in this webinar. To welcome us all in this webinar on behalf of EPCOR, please give a virtual clap for Dr. Jonah P. Acido, a licensed professional teacher who is currently a teacher three at Baras Pinugay Elementary School in Baras Rizal, Philippines. Hello. I'm Audible. Yes, madam. Oh, so good evening, everyone. So I welcome you all for this session for tonight. It's very pleasure to be with you. For all to our head research, uh, to our head research, Dr. Richard Sanchez, thank you for this opportunity. And welcome to our uh, series of national capacity building seminars on research writing for research consultants. On behalf of EDCOR, I welcome you all. Thank you and God bless everyone. Thank you, Dr. Acido. To make this webinar truly effective for all, especially to our student researchers who are with us tonight, actually we have 91 participants. So we have participants from Valenzuela City Polytechnic College. We have from Academia de San Lorenzo and uh, other uh, university. I know there, there is another group, the one that is with uh, Dr. Madeline. Okay? So these are the house rules that we have to observe during the webinar. First, stay on mute. Always turn off your microphone while the resource person is speaking. Click the raise hand button if you have a question or something to share, or use the chat box for questions or clarifications. Second, use headphone if you have. Be active in online discussion. Be sure you have your notebook, pen, or pencil with you. Always activate your camera. That means you have to set your camera on on mode so that the resource speaker and your fellow Koreans can see you. Stay on task and focus so you don't miss anything the resource speaker says. Use certain icon to briefly deliver your thought when you are on mute. Okay, click this icon for yes answer or agreement. Then click this icon if you want to ask or say something. Relax and enjoy your journey with us toward research excellence. Fellow researchers and colleagues, I take this honor and surely a privilege on my part to introduce a well-known teacher researcher. At present, our resource person is the master teacher too at Claro M. Recto High School in Sampaloc, Manila, Philippines to talk about on the topic learning from others as the beginning of a relevant investigation 
sharing of a completed quantitative study. Please give your virtual clap to Dr. Raynan D. Dyson. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for Dr. Rapsing for the very okay. enthusiastic, very warm introduction. Just adjusting my microphone. And can everybody hear me clearly? Yes, very clearly. Loud at at there you this can, time, you sir, uh, please, allow, please allow me to share my PowerPoint. I think it's now visible. Can everybody see it? Yeah. All right, I'll set my, I'll set my timer because <laughs> I've been told that 30 minutes to one hour. Good evening to everyone. Good evening to all the participants of uh, EdCore Philippines, to the head of the research consultant, Dr. Richard Sanchez, the national, to the national consultant and national deputy for research publications and trainings, Dr. A. Slagman and Dr. Ian Lian, Lianares, and to all the, the coordinators and participants for tonight's series of research and capacity building for research. Good evening, and I, I hope uh, I can inspire you, I can educate you and increase your knowledge on research undertakings. And I expect your participation. If I have questions, I want you to answer that in the chat box. And all right, so let me begin. Good evening, my topic has to do with the written discourse competence of grade 11 students, an assessment of bilingual proficiency, an assessment of bilingual proficiency. At this point, let me define the key variables here on the title because I think it's unfamiliar to some, especially for the other disciplines. When we talk about written discourse competence, it has to do with the proficiency in or ability, your competence or ability to produce relatively longer text, more than a paragraph, such as but not limited to essays, novels, short stories, and other longer types of composition. Because some students are just good in producing words, phrases, but longer communication acts or written discourse, they struggle. And an assessment of bilingual proficiency, bilingual has to do with, profic bilingual proficiency refers to the first and the second language competence or being fluent and accurate in the first or home language, which is Filipino and English, the target language based on the, if we're considering the Philippine setting. So bilingual, because my students here are all Filipino. So bilingual proficiency refers to the, their proficiency in Filipino and in English. So let me go to the next slide. Let's talk about the background of the study. What are the reasons or justifications that inspired me to study, to undertake this research, this language research? Of course, there should be reasons or it, Let's talk about the multilingual MTB MLE, one of the inspirations or sources of my inspiration here is the theoretical foundation of the MTB MLE, Mother Tongue Based Multilingual Education, or the MTB MLE. What is the meaning of this, sir? So if the, the goal is, it supports the goal of every child, a reader and a writer by grade one, so I think everybody's familiar with this, that it allows the use of the home language from kinder to grades, grades one to three in teaching content areas such as, but not limited to science, mathematics, social science, and other subjects, because they believe that in order to master, to 
because the first foundation should be mastery of the content. So they're using the MTB MLE was also inspired by the, it hopes to increase the international assessment results because of the results of science and mathematics in international assessment um, in international assessments, we are lagging behind. We're almost at the, at the bottom. So the proponents of this believe that this is a way, one of the significant factors to improve the performance of our Filipino test takers. Another inspiration of my study, I'd like to prove a theory. One of the reasons why you're conducting a study could be you would like to prove whether a theory is applicable in our setting or not. So the theory of Jim Cummins, which is related to bilingualism, it believes that learning the first sec learning another language, that your mastery in the first language facilitates your learning another language. I'm sorry, let me rephrase it. If you are good in the first language, it will be easier for you to learn another language. So we're going to prove that in the and this is one of the theoretical foundations of the MTB MLE. That's why they're using, they've been encouraging the local language in the primary education, such as um, in the kinder until grades three. So now let's look at the theory of Jim Cummins. states that the cognitive literacy skills established in the mother tongue or L1 will transfer across languages. It believes that if you're good, if you have a strong foundation in the local language or home language, for example, Filipino, which is not the national language, which is not the majority language of all Filipinos. So for example, the Tagalog, if you're good at this, it will be easier for you to learn another language. So looking at the, uh, the diagram here, the L1 and L2 has, uh, have differences in on the surface level alone. But if we're going to analyze it closely, dig, if we're going to dig deeper, there are areas, there are commonalities that if you have mastered or built a strong foundation in the first language, it facilitates proficiency in learning another language, second or third languages. For example, on the surface level, let's, it refers to grammar or the syntax, arrangement of words, sometimes in, in another language, it usually begins with subject followed by the verb, but in another language, it usually begins with the verb followed by the subject. Another, in terms of pronunciation, in terms of prefix, suffixes, or morphology, in terms of the terms or the vocabulary, they have a different terms in specific, uh, for example, justice. The word justice in, in the context of Filipinos, it's justicia. But in another languages, they have a different term. Another, in terms of, so that has to do with the surface level alone, that there are different differences on the surface, but if the dig, if we're going to dig deeper in the iceberg theory, there are things that are common among languages. For example, in terms of problem solving skills, in terms of abstract reasoning, literacy skills in terms of analysis, um, synthesis, the higher order thinking skills of Bloom's taxonomy, the HOTS, it, the process of doing the analysis, synthesis, problem solving skills, and, and other critical elements of cognitive domains are just common. For example, in terms of concept, conceptual understanding, conceptual knowledge, the term justice it's just the same across languages, across nationalities, across nations. All you have to do is just to identify the term in another language. But the meaning, the semantics, the pragmatics are just the same. The meaning of generosity, the meaning of kindness, fulfillment, success, happiness, for example, or what else? Other meaning or rape, assault, or harassment. All languages have the same semantic meaning of this term, but you just have, they just differ in terms of the term. In Filipino, it's different when you, when you compare it to another language, but the semantic relationship, this conceptual understanding can be transferred. So it says here that there are things that are common among languages. 
So in the bigger picture, if you have built a strong foundation in the first language, that's why the MTB MLE has been, was proposed, was put into law, because they believe that it's not a waste of time. It's not detrimental if you would like to master another language. I am a Filipino. I want to master English. It's you have to be good in, you don't have to stop using Filipino if you want to master English because your knowledge, your mastery in the first language would facilitate, will help you build a strong foundation, will help you achieve mastery in learning another language. Because according to Jim Cummins, it's transferable. It's common. So that is another foundation of the bilingual education, which is I, which is I, my major. I'm a PhD bilingual major. If is the use of the first and the second language helpful, beneficial to all our learners? Filipino, I am, we have Filipino students. I would like to help. My Filipino students would like to master English. They prioritize more English. Should we encourage them to stop using Filipino? Based on theories, no. And the bilingual education supports the continuation of the continued use of the first language because they have significant relationship. And there are a lot of advantages of being bilingual as compared to monolingual. So that's another inspiration of my study, reasons why we're conducting this. Another English only policy, which is very common across disciplines. There are many private institutions, if not all, would have, have a strong, have a strict policy on English only and uh, in all circumstances, especially for classroom situations, even in the canteen, even in break time, students are encouraged to use English. And as you notice in the Philippines, for example, you would notice that a lot of parents would still, at the, as a young, as one year old, two years old, they introduce the second language and to the point that they are, even they are struggling in the use of English, they would still continue using English when talking to their Filipino children because they believe that if they use Filipino, it's not a good way to help them improve their English. That if you want to improve your English, you have to use English only. That's sole immersion of English. That is the ideology, the federal movement that we need to debunk. We need to educate us by, based on the perspectives of Cummins. Why there are a lot of institutions promoting, strictly promoting the English only policy because they think that if we allow the students to use Eng uh, Filipino, that's it's detrimental. It will not help them improve the second language, which is um, English. Now, a very saddening case, and according to GMA News Online, for speaking Filipino, three students were asked to leave, were expelled to, to leave the school, a Christian school, they because they have a yeah. very strong, they have a strict policy on English only, that even it's break time, you have to use English. So the parents were complaining until it reached the attention of the administration. So the administrators decided to expel the students who were repeatedly using Filipino, in, uh, which is against or in opposition to the university policy, English only. That they must use English only at all times for all communications, whether it's written or spoken. So that's, that's quite saddening because uh, uh, the, the question there is, was there a violation in terms of their linguistic rights? Was there a violation in terms of their free speech? Why they were asked to leave the school? This is not an allegation, but this is true, this is true according to GMA News Online. And now let's refer to review of related, re, my reviewed relate, uh, related literature and studies. What do studies locally and internationally say about the relationship of the first and the second language? Is the first language disadvantageous, the continued use of the first language, detrimental, dysfunctional to the development of the second language? According to my studies, locally and internationally, majority of the findings here would support the significant relationship of the first and second language. That if you're 
the students or the respondents who underwent the study, who took the exams written and spoken, they were good in the first language and they performed relatively better in the second language. So we can infer one of the things we can attribute here is that it's not true that it poses threats to the development of the second language. So because the respondents here were good in, in their first language, they also performed better in their second language, which is English. And they were all considered bilingual. All of the respondents here were considered bilingual. They went through an evaluation process, diagnostic assessment, that they have demonstrated nearly proficient, um, about proficiency in terms of their first and second language. But the findings showed that they have performed better in the second language, despite they have been continually, uh, continuously practicing the first language. So this findings support the idea that it's not, it's advantageous, it's not unfavorable. It's also, it's actually favorable to continue the first language while learning another language. My research question specifically, let me refer to my specific objectives. The study would like to answer the following questions. What is the level of respondents in written discourse in terms, written discourse in Filipino and in English in terms of the following? Claim, development of ideas, cohesion, style, and conventions. All of these four elements are found in the rubric, standardized tools that I have adapted. Later, I will present to you. All of this belong to the category of the argumentative composition. Yes, they, the students were asked to compose uh, argumentative essays in evaluating their first and second language proficiency because these are very big terms. I have just used specific, I have here used argumentative essay as my specimen, as my way of somehow evaluating, assessing, uh, though it's just a part of a whole because there are other elements of language proficiency, such as speaking, listening, and reading. So I just use writing argumentative essay. I asked them to write uh, in Filipino and in English for two consecutive meetings. Later, I will present it in detail. Another the goal of my study is to, to assess the relationship of the first and second language in terms of writing argumentative essay. And the goal is to identify whether the proficiency in the first language predict the proficiency in another language, which is English. Number four, how may the findings be utilized in designing, in in designing an academic research writing course plan for senior high school, specifically reading and writing, one of the core subjects in English for senior high school. Let's assess my, let's take a look at it closely, my research paradigm, and that will answer the scope and limitations of my study. So let's see. I have assessed, I wanted to assess, the study one uh, aimed to assess the proficiency of the written discourse competence of the respondents in Filipino and in English by requiring them to answer, to compose an argumentative essays in first and second language or two meetings, originally five meetings, but because of the policy of DepEd, no disruption of classes, the administrators told me that it should be at least two meetings because the students, I have to use the same students, and probably the third meeting, they could be exhausted already. So just two meetings, two sessions only. Filipino and in English. And what are the things I have evaluated? These are the components of written discourse, statements of claims, argument and arguments, cohesion, coherence, style, and conventions. These are all the specific elements of the argumentative essays based on the standardized tool that I have used. Some students are just good in making claims, even professionals, especially in social media. It's so saddening that they are just giving claims, accusations without proofs. Now, why argumentative essay? Because it has emerged in my study that among the writing patterns of English, even in Filipino, 
the weakest, the most, the most difficult demanding is argumentative composition as compared to narrative, persuasive, which would require, which would allow them to use their emotions, their feelings, their biases, and their prejudices in composing their, their stories. But here, it should be based on facts, based on proofs. This is the problem in, even in social media. A lot, a lot of students, even professionals, would post allegations, accusations against individual or organization without evidence. So here, they are challenged to support their claims using a, a concrete pieces of evidence, acceptable. It should be based on facts, not just hearsays. Cohesion. However, in addition, furthermore, also in other conjunctions and or but coherence. This is later you will discover this is the most difficult for the respondents. Coherence refers to their, they have the ability to compose, to connect their paragraphs or sentences meaningfully, logically, because sometimes the writers would they deviate or would digress from their topic. This is the topic, but they would talk about other things. So coherence, it should be all sentences and paragraphs are interrelated. And then style and conventions would refer to their, would refer to yeah, style and convention, punctuation marks, and capitalizations are also assessed. And then the intention of the study is for, to produce, to offer, policy recommendations, to encourage policy recommendations or produce, to revisit the, arg the academic writing course plan for the senior high school. Now let's go to the methodology. How did I conduct the study? The study utilized quantitative approach and a descriptive correlational design because I wanted to assess the connection of the first and second language of the respondents, if it is true that if you're good in Filipino, you could be better in English. Or the second language, it, the first language is better as compared to second language proficiency because of the, we, I would like to assess the theory. I'd like to prove whether the theory is applicable in the context of the Filipinos, uh, Filipino learners. Another, here, as regards the implementation of my study, originally I proposed five sessions, but because of no disruption of classes policies, I was only allowed to conduct this for two sessions. And here, or they were asked to write one in one hour for Filipino, and then a little later, 30 minutes later, 15 minutes, they were asked to write in uh, first in English and the second one is in Filipino. But they were not informed ahead of time that you're going to translate it. So I we wanted to assess if there would be change of uh, content or change of ideas. But the first, uh, before they could write the second one, they had to submit the first one. So we could see the consistency of their composition, if there would be improvement in the second version. So here are the topics, approved topics by the panelists. So this was conducted in two sessions. Among the grade 11 students of, from six div schools division offices. So here from Quezon City, from Mandaluyong, Pasay, Las Piñas, uh, following the order of the DEPED NCR, our region, in terms of the proper conduct, proper doc documentation of this research. So they were monitored, they were asked to write in two sessions for data and privacy act. I will not mention their names. Their names are not published. They're not included, even the name of the school here, because there are, you don't have to publish everything when you're submitting your work for confidentiality. Now, as regards data analysis, the, I have used, the study used mean and standard deviation, linear regression, and t-statistic. And t I have, of course, uh, 
uh, given this, I have left this uh, to the mastery. I have entrusted my statistician to examine this. Being a language major, but of course, I need to understand this uh, as a researcher. So these are the statistical tools that were used in this study to check the predictability of the first language, second language uh, test result in terms of their composition. So here, as mentioned earlier, common core state standards writing rubrics were used. So this is a standardized tool. As much as possible, when you're conducting a study, you have to look it, we have to follow, you must follow validity and reliability principles of the, the assessments. So following the validity and reliability of uh, assessment, the conduct in terms of conduct of uh, assessment. So here I have adopted the Common Core Standards instrument, which has been adopted, utilized by all language experts and even all language teachers across nations. Because if you're going to analyze it, it's really appropriate to their level and all the considerations were followed strictly in their rubric. Now let's find out the results. Let's, let's identify what happened. Is the theory of commons true in the context of our Filipino learners? But again, I'd like to clarify that I'm just assessing a part of the whole. This is this should not categorically refute the study, the theory of an expert. He is a giant in the field of language teaching. So based on the result in assessing the relationship of the respondent's ability to compose first uh, argumentative essays in Filipino and in English, <clears throat> there is no significant relationship because they performed better in, uh, yeah, there's no significant relationship. So as you can see here, uh, the test results showed that they're, they're actually better in English as compared to Filipino. But the theory says, if you're good in English, it you could be better in, if you're good in the first language, it should facilitate learning another language. But in other tables, you, though, because I have time limit now, <clears throat> the other tables in my studies would show that some of the aspects of the test results would show that they're performing better in the first language, but not uh, as compared to the second language. In terms of cohesion and style and conventions, they perform that the test, the assessment results are better in Filipino as compared to English. While coherence and statement of claims would show that they have it's higher, they're they're better in English as compared to Filipino. That's why the result show that it's there's no significant relationship. There it doesn't necessarily predict that you're good in Filipino. It will automatically transfer to another language, which is English. So even here in other tables, no significant relationship because there's inconsistent test results. If you're going to analyze the what appeared in the assessment in the essay, in the essays of the respondents, some respondents perform better in this features in cohesion and coherence in the first language, but lower in English. While the other respondents uh, presenting it to me your slideshows, Kadalas on plan. That... Sorry. Yes. Are there comments from our panelists? From our dear participants, I I I heard some were commenting. Unintentional. Is that a comment? I'm reading the message. Yeah, you may continue. Maybe they, they maybe it was accidentally pressed. Ah, okay, thank you. <laughs> but I encourage uh, feedback after this. Thank you. So there's no significant relationship. 
I was also surprised. I was personally, I was expecting that it would be consistent that they are better in English in all aspects, in all components of the rubrics as compared to Filipino. But surprisingly, two elements there show that they are better in Filipino but not in English. So the, I was really surprised with the result. So there, I have presented it as it is to the panelists. Families are here, so they were checked by um, language teachers, not me. So I have invited, I requested other language experts, <clears throat> teachers who have completed their masters in language education in checking the essays of my students. To avoid biases, I should not be the one checking my own work, my, my respondents' work. So here, uh, one of the significant results of the study is the R majority of the respondents are not so good. Three aspects, they were above average, proficient, nearly proficient. But in terms of coherence, the respondents, who are the respondents? These are the students who, who had 85 to 90 in Filipino and English in their grade 10. So based on the cards, so they were selected. Now, so here, coherence. What do you mean coherence? This is the most uh, difficult element for the respondents. Coherence has to do with the relationships, the logical relationship of ideas. The title should be connected to the uh, introduction, the introduction should be connected to the body and all elements of the entire composition. Title, introduction, body, and conclusion should be, must be interrelated. But probably due to time constraint, there were parts of their sentences that were not relevant to the thesis, not relevant to the main discussion. For example, the issue has to do with as a politician's involvement in drugs. But they would mention about the character of the politician, which is below the belt. They would mention about the immoral aspects of politicians in other family affairs, but not focusing on the involvement on drug, which is the subject. So some people, for example, in debate, that's what's happening when they're losing in an argument. This is the issue. This is the thesis. But you're attacking my character. You're going beyond the topic. So coherence has to do with the connection of ideas, that the title must be connected to the body, body must be connected to the uh, introduction until conclusion. All elements of composition must be interrelated. That's why the definition of an essay is, it's a group of paragraphs that develop one main idea. You cannot talk about other things. If the issue here is, gender uh, discrimination in, in terms of gender. So gender discrimination. You cannot insert or mention about uh, sexual harassment or the discrimination as regards physical appearance, socioeconomic status, because that would lose the focus of the writer. The readers would be misguided, would not understand your composition. So I this is one of the things that we must uh, encourage, we must assist, we must find ways on how to assist our learners in developing ability to compose coherent sentences and paragraphs. So I was surprised the conclusion would have different ideas. So the, the rule in composition, the rule in essay, uh, but when you reach conclusion, you should not introduce new idea, but Surprising me in the respondent's composition, the conclusion part is the conclusion part would talk about new ideas, not about the thesis statement, not related to the issues mentioned in the body in the introduction. So I'm seeing <laughs> um, who is pressing my PowerPoint. I'm seeing here. So here, coherence is one of the things that must be developed among our learners. Next, discussion result. Now, if we're going to rev uh, going back to the reviewed related literature and studies, 
going back to the theories mentioned in the theoretical framework in the introduction, it, the model of Jim comments that would support the study would be separate underlying proficiency. What does it mean? That first language proficiency doesn't affect the development of your second language. That our brains process things that because the minds of the learners operate independently. That it doesn't mean you're good in first language or second language. The first will be affected and vice versa because they operate in differently, independently. So that, that is the model of Jim Cummins on separate underlying proficiency. That would explain the result. That's one of the possible explanations. Another medium of instruction. Another possible explanations uh, as regards the result of the study. <clears throat> the medium of instruction, the language used in instructional materials and tests, and the language in almost all domains and in various institutions in the Philippines are written in English. So that's why we have, it's very difficult to achieve the intellectualization of the Filipino language because everything, almost everything is written in English. That the test, textbooks, language of education, language of law, business and commerce, written and spoken, mode of communication are in English. So that could be a possible explanation why they have performed better in English in some aspects of the test results because they prioritize English. Gardner's social educational model and significance of motivation. Another possible reason, that's why they have, as regards performing better in the second language as compared to the first language, is because the motivation of the respondents. They see that English is given so much priority, is seen to be the most important in terms of communication. If you want to be successful in the workplace, at work, in general, in life, you need to be good in English. That's why the motivation is so high. They place so much value in learning English. Because um, again, we are analyzing about the test result, why they are performing better in English as compared to Filipino. So these are just possible reasons. I cannot mention everything because of time limit. Now, the recommendations, some of the recommendations due to time constraint here, develop instructional material, materials in the first and second language. Wait, I have develop instructional materials in their students' first language in support of every child must be a reader by grade, by grade one. I still support following the reviewed related literature and significant uh, the majority of the local and international studies to still support the idea that you must still master the first language, allow the learners to use their local language in grades in kinder to grades three for the mastery of the content before you introduce the second language. It's not yet too late. By grade three, it's not yet too late. Yes, we have critical hypothesis, critical period hypothesis that as much as possible, as early as a young age, you have to introduce a second language, but grade three is not yet too late. Okay, a little later, I will answer that. Next, allow the students to use their L1 in generating ideas during pre-writing stage to produce higher quantity of ideas. So here, because the models of writing, if we're going to evaluate the writing, uh, the models, the theories in developing writing proficiency, they would still encourage the use of first language in so they could perform, they could produce higher ideas, higher quantity of ideas. Instead of immediately thinking or activating or generating ideas in the second language. Each learner's different discourse, writing patterns for them to know the salient features and purpose of each type of writing. That if, when I analyzed the compositions of the respondents, I was surprised they were 
the problem is overgeneralization. The patterns of the rules in narrative composition, persuasive composition, are different when you compose the other types of essays, such as argumentative. So they have different rules. They have different writing patterns. So they must be thought about this because they, they transfer it they, as if it's the same rule. In narrative, for example, it allows opinions. It allows emotions. You're even nonfiction at times or even fictions at times. But in argumentative essay, you have to be, all the statements there must be drawn from facts, from scientific evidence. Number four, conduct seminar workshops on argumentative writing with emphasis on scientific and ethical communications. The problem in social media, a lot of students and even professionals, they would engage, they would proliferate or help. Uh, cultivate the culture of fake news. Some are so, so sad about that they would even comment, post, like, share the comments which are obviously fake. So let's, the argumentative writing, if they are trained about this, they would be engaged in the proper way of argumenting and commenting that everything should be based on facts, that you have to ensure that your statements require validation that when you assert something, when you claim it should have proof or tangible evidence for ethical communications and scientific. So here next. After all, because of time limit, I cannot present everything in the paper. So I'll just leave you with this quotation. Education in one's native language is a human right. Your language is your right. Good evening. Thank you so much for listening. That concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Dizan, for the very comprehensive presentation of your research paper. Now, before proceeding to the question and answer, let's. Uh, I would like to invite everyone to please open your camera for our photo op. So you must have a souvenir. So please open your camera. My assistant is not here, so I'll be using my cell phone. <laughs> okay, so please open your camera. We'll be taking the picture one by frame by frame. So we have four frames because actually we have 96 very strong participants. Okay, smile and keep your best smile. Okay, can they have picture? Frame number two, you continuously smile because you don't know where, where you belong here, okay? Please open your camera so we can have our picture taking. Dr. Richard does not want to be, <laughs> does not want to be, you know, please open your camera, but definitely I respect your decision not to open your camera for privacy but what's important is you all have you are all here okay thank you so much now at this point fellow researchers and colleagues our resource speaker is now ready to entertain and answer your questions now if you want to you know you if you want to verbalize your question you can unmute your microphone but please uh, state your name and uh, the school or the organization of which you are you are uh, you know connected so you'll be properly recognized you have to introduce yourself and those who are a little bit shy you can make use of the chat box uh, write, you write your question in the chat box and then i'll just read it for our resource uh speakers who would like to start okay who would like to start Any question? Any clarification? About here the in the chat box, sir? Yeah, I in the chat box, we, we have, we have one. From so Mary I will Jean. read. Yeah, I will read the question, sir. From Mary Jane S. Castillo. Ma'am, from where are you? Ma'am, Mary Jane. Which division? Okay. Uh, research consultant natin yan, Doc. Okay. <laughs> So he, she's one of the research consultants of it. Our proud research consultants. 
Okay, since the study is about this course, why not have a pure qualitative research design discourse analysis to have an in-depth analysis of the languages involved and a thorough investigation of the phenomenon under investigation so that it will be best complement with humans theory. Maybe you belong to the same uh, area, sir. Arinan, you're both language experts. Yes. Okay, sir. <laughs> Reynan? Uh, thank you so much for the recommendation. I would consider that. But based on the review-related literature, I have specifically followed the recommendation of the previous researchers because one of the justifications in conducting a research study can be based on research gaps. So I have checked in the library about the past researchers' research uh, about the past uh, quantitative studies related to re, uh, written discourse. So it appeared there what emerged that is the most uh, problematic is argumentative essay. So I have also been inspired by this argumentative essay in assessing the written discourse because I know written discourse is so big and it's just an element, a part of a whole, their argumentative essay that uh, a lot of reviewed locally and internationally uh, quant quantitative studies on, art, on written discourse showed me that argumentative writing is problematic. So that made me choose the quantitative side because I, have, I would like also to revisit the curriculum of the senior high school in terms of reading and writing, which is one of the core subjects to offer recommendation. And so it will be best complement comments theory. So thank you for the suggestion. I would consider that. But maybe again, would you, you maybe sir mm -hmm. Reynan, you just put it in, in another, you know, you just put it in your recommendation that it uh, that the study should be conducted the purely qualitatively to include the mm -hmm. human theory. Okay. All right, thank you. For the insights, Ma Mary Castillo. So anyone who would like to ask question? Anybody from our 96 participants would like to ask question? Uh, any clarification, any, you know, any uh, uh, recommendation or suggestions? Because, uh, you know, I believe that after this, maybe you are into your your paper or in your research for your dissertation maybe uh, whatever we can come up here would be a good source of research topic okay but then may may recommend my suggestion sir why did you not come up with mixed method qualitative and quantitative why just focus on quantitative because of that reason alone that you have yeah. just mentioned you did not think of having mixed method like qualitative and quantitative because the way I look at your presentation, the way mm -hmm. I look at your paper, it could be, it is very possible mm -hmm. to have a mixed method. Mm -hmm. That's my I, only opinion. I thank you. I respectfully acknowledge that and I will consider that um, if when time permits that I can continue this for a different setting, in a different setting and for different uh, respondents. Thank you. I will consider the mixed method. Okay, we have another question here from Sir Ranulfo El Bisaya. Definitely, yes. he is also a research consultant. Okay, Mr. Bisaya, please, or Dr. Bisaya. Thank you, thank you, Doc. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rapsing. Can I? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, very clear. Uh, um, thank you, Dr. Dizon, for sharing your expertise on this particular topic. I just have uh, because you mentioned in your discussion the importance of acquiring and mastering the first language before introducing the target or second language. But the truth is early learning or educational institutions juxtapose the two languages, L1 and L2. So what is your take on this practice or what would be the possible impact of this kind of practice? Specifically in the foundational or the early years of learning among our children. I, I support the idea when I reviewed the MTB MLE, 
the idea there is to master the content in the primary years. Mm-hmm. I and content support, of what? Content of the first content language. Content of yeah, the literacy in terms of learning, science, mathematics, um, and social sciences. For example, social issues and uh, learn, learning about mathematics and sciences, and uh, that they can better that they can better express themselves in 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 the first language in home language. And some and in most cases, there is a problem when in terms of transition when they are at home using the first language, especially for the students in the public setting, and then they would go to school using another language. So when I review the MTB MLE, they support the idea that in order to increase the international test results in science and mathematics. One of the objectives is to allow the local languages to mm-hmm. be used in teaching in there until grade three. So, and in support of uh, the expert statement that it's not detrimental, it's not disadvantageous that when you're using both at home or allowing or using the first language, even in school at times, or mm-hmm. depending on the subjects, while targeting to master another language, it's just okay. Mm-hmm. But it will not lead to confusion. It will not lead to cognitive delays because there are myths in terms of bilingualism that it will lead to confusion. It will mm-hmm. result in cognitive def- deficits. So, so, so in a way, you are in favor of juxtaposing the two languages, even if at some point you can say that they have not yet mastered the first language. And introducing right away or introducing at some point language. the second uh, language by grade three sir uh that's the early exit bilingual program wherein mm-hmm. that's the time you can introduce a second language but yeah that's, grade, that's why sir, that's why going back to my point there are some learning institutions or academic institutions that as early as preschool for instance yes, yes, yes. they introduce the second language with the target or second language english juxtaposing it with the first language or mother tongue so in my view i don't support it so i'm sorry if i did not get it uh, uh in the beginning but now it's clear to me that your point is using it as early as kinder no, exactly yes exactly it. and I, I don't support it following the the findings in the studies related to the first and second language relationship or the correlation of the two that it's you have to enjoy to allow mastery the, of the first language from kinder to grade three uh, probably just an input probably it works in some groups wherein yeah. some students a particular group of students have already exposure or are at homes at homes they have exposure of the second language in other, i mean not necessarily second, but it becomes already their first language english as their first language at home so that's why when they go to school uh, introducing introducing english would be somehow like already like uh like a walk in the park for them so it's easier for them this time to acquire this this uh, yeah, quote unquote yeah. second language for others for other groups of students, uh, but generally for for Filipino learners it's kind of difficult to introduce right away a second language which is which is basically basically juxtaposing it with the first language. First which is, language. Yes, yes, that's it. That's my point. Thank you, Doctor Dizon. Thank you. Also, that's a good uh, point to consider. Dr. Dizon, I have a question while waiting for others to write their questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Desire, for that Ran- very for that great question. Desire. Yeah, this Thank is so actually in support of, very uh, meaningful of, the, uh, input. of this state, yeah, of the statement of Dr. Desire. Because I agree with him. Now, may I ask your respondents, are they from private school or public schools? Uh, they are all from fri- from public schools uh, public. okay because because uh, uh, correct me if i'm wrong dr bisayan because you know if if a student is uh, enrolled in a private school usually <laughs> usually they tend to speak english than the first language correct, so it's, correct. Easy, it's easy for them to learn the second language 
than the first language. It's mm -hmm. not that I'm bragging about my uh, my mga apos. You see, my mga apos are they are you know they are used to to speak in English. So when they go to school, they they're better off. Well, they're better off when they speak in English than in Filipino. Actually, the result of their, of their report card shows that, shows that. their grades in their English grades. is 98 and their grades in <laughs> Filipino, oh, I'm sorry, it's 85 or 83. So ah. it's so very low. So you see, that's why I, I asked really the, the respondents that you have, if they are, you know, I'm not belittling those that are in the public. School, in the public, of course. Uh, yes. This is the real... Uh, the the real culture is the different. Real, that's why I agree with the Sir Sir Bisaya of his uh, of his uh, claim that uh, and even your report, isn't mm -hmm. it one of your findings was uh, they, they perform better in, in in the second language yeah. than in the first language. That in the first language. Yes, I understand the culture of public and private is different in the private yeah. schools because automatically it, in most cases. As early but don't as get me there. wrong, huh? don't get me wrong, sir. Yes. Don't get me but wrong. That's, that, a, that's a reality. That's, that's yeah, a fact. That's, that's my in, observation in only being schools. in a private school. Yes. Yeah, but, you're uh, really very correct. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, no, it's a sort of a crime talking, uh, talking in Filipino with all our students in the private school because maybe the parents would hear us talking to them in Tagalog and then in, at home they are they are talking they are talking to them in English you know uh, -huh. uh that's my point only so I don't thank you thank you for the good for the yeah. suggestion yes that's a big consideration also in terms of respondents because if my okay. respondents were private were coming from private schools uh obviously yeah. the, the practices as early as kinder they have yeah. been trained exposed uh, substantially exposed to the second language so expect that they would perform better in English. Yeah, maybe that's the effect of global globalization. Because globalization. Uh, as as we have said, you know, uh, just like in other schools, the students are prepared for global competitiveness. But ask them, how many languages do you know? <laughs> they only know yeah. they only know one language. So that's not global competitiveness. Yes, because if you really would like your students to be globally competitive, you have to offer lots of languages. And I know the language. public schools. Are doing that, especially those yeah, we have in French. sciences. Yeah. Oh, uh, any other question? Because we have a very limited time. Our airing time yes. is only, you know. You have any question or everything is clear with you? And I would like to thank, of course, Dr. Mary Jane Castillo, one of our research consultants, and Dr. Anulfo Bisaya, one of our research consultants, also. Maybe they, they have been presented, they have presented already their papers here, or they have uh, our doctor, our very uh, you know, very energetic and very uh, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard, maybe we'll be inviting them to present theirs also in the future. And also I'm inviting my uh, the research director of Valenzuela, City Polytechnic. College, Dr. Signora, to be part of the research consultant. So you may now submit Dr. Signora to Dr. Richard your application to be in for, for, be, for the research consultancy. Okay, there is another question here. Good evening, Po. I'm sorry, may I know for the title of the. Okay, from Sir Darren Juno Linato. So, Dr. Darren, a research consultant, I suppose. Good evening, Po. I'm sorry, may I know for the title of the research? I wasn't able to catch it up. Thanks, Po. Will you kindly type it? i uh, type it here. Thanks again. Okay, the title is the written discourse competence, competence of grade 11 students, an assessment of bilingual proficiency. Okay. And then sir? as as, as our, uh, at this point, <laughs> while they're thinking of their question. I am very grateful for the active participation of our dear participants. I appreciate the input, the clarifications, the, the suggestions of the teachers here from Teacher Castillo, uh, Dr. Mary Jane Dr. Castillo, Lee Natok, and the others. I'm also learning, even from you, sir, from the Moderator, all your suggestions are respectfully acknowledged and will definitely be considered in assessing and improving my work. And anyway, this is an avenue for us to learn. We're still continuing. Yes. We are all researchers, right? 
Okay. Lear learning um, is a continuous process. Process. Thank you also, Sir Linato. No more questions, so we can uh, Thank you proceed. so much for all those who raised their questions. Okay, if everything is clear, now uh, I would like to thank you uh, all for the great exchange of ideas, especially those ideas coming from um, Castillo and Sir Visaya. Thank you so much. At this point, our EFCOR people will provide you with the evaluation link. No, we will provide you with the evaluation link. We'll be sending you the evaluation link. Okay, so since you are part of the webinar, we, you already you receive all the uh, the link given by Sir Richard. So we'll be sending you the evaluation link also, and you have 24 hours to accomplish and return the evaluation. And uh, if you would like to request for a certificate, you, you, you have to submit the evaluation. Without the evaluation, there will be no certificate of from coming from EPCOR that will be that will be given to you. Am I right, Dr. Richard? Yes, Dr. Yes, okay. So in exchange of your certificate, if you request for one, your evaluation. So we'll be sending you the evaluation. Now, we are getting nearer to the end of our webinar, but please stay online up to the last part of the webinar. Now we have the uh awarding of the certificate of recognition to our very eloquent presenter so may i read the citation at core educational research center santana pampanga philippines presents the certificate of recognition to dr reynand b Dizon, research consultant at core educational research center for his invaluable time and expertise as a resource speaker in the series of national capacity building seminars on research writing for research consultants of EDCOR Educational Research Center held from October 2021 until March 2, 2022. Signed by Dr. Ian Yanares, National Deputy Consultant for Research Publications and Training, Dr. A.C. Lagman, National Consultant for Research publication and trainings, and Dr. Richard D. Sanchez, head research consultant. Okay, so please accept this certificate. So this will be so provided much. to you, sir. Yeah, sir Reynand. Okay. Thank you so much po, to everybody who has participated, especially okay. the teachers who have raised their clarifications. Appreciate it so much. So uh, before closing, let me share my screen. So before we close, of course. I would like to everyone to be informed of the following. Okay. Look for us. Of course, next event. So the next event, maybe we will learn from Dr. Richard. He'll be posting it. I are very energetic and very, you know, competent and everything. Okay. I, I know he is the founder of Edcore. Okay. For the Edcore's next event. So the series will last until March 2, 2022. So you, you will be invited again to watch and uh, attend series of webinar. And you will meet experts in the field of research. Then, of course, the EdCourse International Awards for Outstanding Educators and Researchers. I know this will go, this will gonna be happening this December. I suppose I'm I right. But anyway, I am always uh, I am I, I am always tend to be corrected by our Dr. Richard Sanchez. I know they are so very busy contemplating, you know, scrutinizing, evaluating, and assessing all the documents or papers. Uh, of the applicants for these uh, uh, international awards. So when you say international, it's not only from the Philippines, it's all over the world. And the I Enjoyed Edwards Research Journal, what's out for this? Maybe the first issue will be released by January. That was, I was informed before, <laughs> you know, because I got interested to be part of this, being a peer reviewer. But then I failed to submit my <laughs> application. That's why. Uh, I am no longer qualified because I, I did not uh, meet the deadline. Okay, 
Then we have our Edward's official t-shirt and polo shirts being sold by Blueprint Shop. Let me remind you that, you know, it's not Edward that is selling the shirts. That I, I would like to be, that I would like to be clarified. It's not Edward's that is selling the shirts. It is Blueprint, but then Edward's accredited Blueprint to uh, customize the official t-shirt and polo shirts of F4. I hope, you know, to Richard, just give me a link so I can order one <laughs> so that I am very proud to wear F4 shirts, okay? Then, of course, fellow researchers and colleagues, for the closing message on behalf of F4, please extend your virtual clap for Dr. Madeline B. Stasio, the Vice President for Academics of the University of La Salette. Incorporated, Santiago City, Isabella, Philippines. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Joji. Thank you. Yeah. A very good evening, fellow research enthusiasts. As we mark the end of another series of capacity building seminar for research consultants, I wish to commend you all for having made time out of your busy schedules to attend this event for our continuous professional development by listening to the excellent presentations and discussions of Dr. Ray, I'm sure we have gained a deeper understanding that learning from others would empower each researcher to also conduct relevant investigations. As researchers, we always have this burning desire to answer different questions of how, what, which, when, and why about a phenomenon, behavior, or situation. This desire is never ending. As we learn from various scholarly works, as we review literature, as we listen to the experiences of other researchers, we begin to build knowledge and learn important concepts, research methods, and techniques relative to our field. Another great benefit of learning from other researchers is that you'll get a better understanding of how research findings are presented and discussed in your particular discipline. If you pay attention to what you read and try to achieve a similar style, you'll become more successful at writing for your discipline. I would like to, to take this moment to thank our speaker, Dr. Ray Dizon, for excellently sharing his research titled, The Written Discourse Competence of Grade 11 Students, an Assessment of Bilingual Proficiency. Much appreciation is also given to our session chair and energetic moderator, Dr. Joji M. Rapsing, for a well-organized event tonight. Of course, my fellow coach, thank the participants and everyone involved in planning and holding this event, especially to Dr. Sanchez. We are truly grateful for your valuable contribution and attendance. Mabuha yang etcore for providing these opportunities for us to grow together as researchers in our own fields. Again, thank you. Thank you very much. Very well said, Dr. Max Istasio. I hope to be back in your university. I went there last time. Wow. Okay, that's, uh, thank nice you very to much. Hear. Yeah, yeah. Really, really. I love your, you know, I love your university. Thank you very much, Dr. Istasio. And with that, salamat for joining us in this EPCOR event. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity, Dr. Richard Chance, Sanchez, and the EPCOR big men and women. Let us all bow our heads for the closing prayer. Ama, maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong pagsama sa araw na ito. Tunay nga na hindi mo kami iniwan pagkus kami ay yung sinamahan at pinagtagumpay. Sa iyo lamang namin Panginoon, ipinagkakatiwala ang lahat-lahat. At ang tagumpay na ito ay tangi sa iyo lamang Panginoon. Patuloy niyo po kaming samahan 
palakasin at pagtukumpayin sa anumang hamon ng buhay. Ito ay ang itinataas sa inyong dakilang pangalan at makapangyarihan sa lahat. Amen. Okay. And thank you to all. Thanks so much. Okay, we have lots of deep things here. And thank you to our team, Dr. Mads, Dr. Jonna, and Dr. Dizon, Dr. Ray. Thank you. And with this, we say, mabuhay, keep safe, everyone. Be healthy. Get vaccinated. I have already my booster shot. Dr. Gina, wow. you apply now for you know being one of our research consultants. You will enjoy being with us. <laughs>